Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. I feel like I've said this a lot, but thank you once again for braving the weather to come and be with us today for Food for Thought or the aftermath of the weather. Um, we really appreciate you being here to support this free community program. So thank you so much for coming out once again in our lovely spring weather on Nantucket. Um, we have another exciting installment today. If you haven't already, please take this time to silence your cell phones as to not disrupt our presentation today. And we thank you, as always, for supporting this program, which is also made possible in part by the MS Worthington Foundation. Today we have with us Lee Saperstein. Uh, Lee first visited Nantucket with his wife and children in 1976, and they bought a home here in 1979, which they retired to in 2007. He has a BS in Mining Engineering from the Montana School of Mines and a DPhil in Engineering Science from Oxford University, which he attended as a Rhodes Scholar. He has been a Mining Engineering faculty member at the Pennsylvania State University, the University of Kentucky, and the University of Missouri Rolla. He is a licensed professional engineer and is an expert in the environmental impacts of mining. On Nantucket, he serves on the Committee of Roads and Right-of-Way, the Cemetery Commission, and has served as secretary of the Article 68 Work Group, which worked on rules for applying fertilizer on Nantucket. Today, he will discuss how the Committee on Roads and Right-of-Way, following its charge to provide access to the open spaces <clears throat> on Nantucket, has located a substantial portion of the roadbed and will be working with landowners to open the railroad once again to the community. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Lee Saperstein. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, folks. And if you'll permit me, I'll, uh, I'll go into roll just for a minute. Yes. The train now standing at Steamboat Wharf is the 1207 for Sconset, calling at Washington Street, Milestone Crossing, Tom Never's Head, and Sconset. All aboard! Now, the conductor would wave at the engineer, and the engineer, we had, we had, a, we had a little premonition of what was going to come. The engineer would sound his whistle, <laughs> and off they'd go. So, with, with that little bit as a start, let me tell you uh, something of what we were about, and we as the Committee on Roads and Right-of-Way. Um, and before I do that, let me give a few acknowledgments. Harvey Young was a member of the committee when we first cooked this up, and he said to me, you know, Lee, if you go down Forest Avenue to the end, you can see the old embankment. I bet there's a lot of it still left on the island. And out of that little conversation came the idea uh, to locate the railroad bed. Uh, part of the thanks you've already seen, we've got some almost 30 photographs and maps from the uh, Historical Association who very generously let me copy them. I relied a lot on Clay Lancaster's book, The Far Out Island Railroad, uh, which was published in 1972. Lancaster was a local historian who, uh, if you remember Lindsay's introduction, was actually a Kentuckian and so we met Clay Lancaster at the University of Kentucky Library, where he was talking about the architecture of old Kentucky rather than Nantucket. Uh, he did an extensive search in the Athenaeum through the newspapers of the time. So if you remember, the old saw is, believe nothing of what you hear and only half of what you see. So the validity of all of this is the newspaper reports uh, from the time, and we'd like to think that maybe they were better than half correct. And of course, the members of our committee and Joe Marklinger, who assembled the map, which is something on which I'm going to end. So here's our outline of, of the talk. We'll talk a little bit about the right of way, uh, roads and right of way committee, and uh, uh, access to the public lands. And to bring you up to speed, we'll talk about the history of the Nantucket Railroad which extended from 1879 to 1918. Now, bluntly, the railroad was a commercial entrepreneurial venture designed to help sell land on the beaches. It was part of the transition of Nantucket from uh, a fishing and agrarian community 
uh, to an artist colony and a resort community. Uh, we will show you uh, how to get, how the railroad got to the sea, and also what we can see today. And uh, since it's mostly publicly accessible land, we'll finish up with uh, just a comment or two about how we might market and make um, walking trails out of it. So as I said, the Committee on Roads and Right of Way serves to protect and expand our ability to get to the public lands, and in particular, the beaches. Uh, we were the ones that put the granite posts that said public way. Uh, we're the ones that advised the town on things that ought to be done to improve uh, our roads. The newspaper this morning uh, from Elise Linscott, the reporter at the INM, talked about our uh, discussions on First Way and Bacchus Way uh, so as to improve safety for the children going to school. And the railroad project, of course, is a parallel to that. We're going to find uh, the roadbed, we're going to identify it, and we hope that uh, we can get people to preserve it and protect it, and in turn, make a walking path. And of course, as I said, two-thirds or more is owned by the town, the Conservation Foundation, or the Nantucket Island Land Bank. So, the railroad. A group of entrepreneurs got together in 1879 and they said, we need a railroad, uh, or we actually we need a way to get to the beaches. Uh, they, like all committees on Nantucket, nothing happened instantly. Uh, they did their engineering and layout work in 1880 and started laying rail in 1881 uh, and actually had an engine moving back and forth. 1882 was the first run to Surfside, and wow, 1883, the Surfside Hotel opened. It was a grand structure, and people flocked to it. In 1884, they took the rail from Surfside along the beach uh, to Sconset, and they bought a second engine so they could have two trains running uh, instead of three or four times a day, eight or ten times a day. Unfortunately, nothing worked out quite as planned, and between 1890 and 94, uh, it got a little insecure financially. Well, it was a good idea, so let's go get some new sucker, I mean, investors. And uh, it was reincorporated as the Nantucket Central Railroad. In 1895, they realized that Surfside was not as popular as Sconset. Most people were getting on the train to go to Sconset, so they rerouted the train direct to Sconset. In 1899, the hotel fell down, as magnificent as it was. Without maintenance and repair, uh, water got in and a portion of it fell down. In an attempt, 1907, to make the railroad a year-round venture, I should say that the railroad up until then only ran in the summertime. Remember, it was trying to get people to the beach, so there was little call uh, to use it. Uh, in the winter. But as Sconset grew and as some of the other communities grew, there was a sense that maybe we could go year-round. So they bought this little gasoline-powered uh, cart that they called the Bug. And then they attached to it a little open car, which they called the Bird Cage. And they even went and bought an old uh, streetcar, looking like uh, a trolley car or a tram, but had a gasoline-powered engine in it. It didn't work very well. It was unreliable. It only lasted a season. 1910, we needed to reinvest, and so the name went back to the Nantucket Railroad. In 1912, the bug goes back into regular use. I might as well tell you the story. Well, I'll hold the story. I've got a picture of the bug, and I'll tell you about the poor ending to, uh, to the bug and also um, perhaps demolish one of the little myths about the railroad. <clears throat> okay, 1916, Tom Never's Head was developed. Um, the railroad went right down through the middle of the development. And we'll show you some pictures showing you the route through Tom Never's and the fact that Tom Never's follows the railroad. 1918, uh, the end of the war was in sight. The ban on automobiles was rescinded and the railway collapsed forever until we revive it as a walking path. So, a little bit about the railroad. There were two engines. This is engine number two. It carried its water and coal. Um, 
in the back, right here, which made it a tank engine. And so if anybody has read to their grandchildren, Thomas, the tank engine, that's a tank engine. Uh, it, combination baggage and uh, passenger car. And this one may well be the car that um, we see on Main Street as the club car. Um, it started at Steamboat Wharf. And this particular picture has got both engines. And that's the full size engine, engine number one called Diana's, after Mrs. Tr uh, Tristram Coffin. And engine number two, the tank engine, was sometimes called Sconset. Now, look at where it's parked. This is Steamboat Wharf. And it would leave Steamboat Wharf and come around uh, the Easy Street Basin. But I don't know what they called it then, because there was no Easy Street, as you can see in the photograph. Uh, Easy Street, uh, Candle Street, Washington Street, that was the route of the railroad up until uh, the Goose Pond. Track was laid. And so I threw this picture in. By the way, this is Dionys De without the tender. So it's only going to go for a few feet before it has to hook up to its water and coal supply. It was a narrow gauge railroad, three feet wide. They used whatever they could find for ties. English call them sleepers. And uh, they nailed... Uh, or spiked the rail right down onto the ties, so there were no tie plates underneath. Um, it, I've been told when the railroad was abandoned and they pulled the spikes out, the workers, the salvage workers, threw the spikes into boxes and then just left them because they were going to pick them up later. And apparently people can still pick up uh, spikes where, where they were abandoned. The rail, as everything else except for the club car, went back off island. Um, rail is measured by weight per length. Wow, OK. So it's pounds per yard. And this stuff looks like it's 40 to 50 pounds. Uh, Mainline Railroad is 110 to 120 pounds per yard. Um, so just something to, for you to store away for your next Trivial Pursuit game. Everything had to, of course, come by barge. I looked at this picture carefully, and I realized there are two overhangs there. So they've actually got two cars on, on this barge. Lifting them up, uh, they will presumably drop them onto the wheels, which railroad people call the bogies. <clears throat> because it was seasonal, uh, there was space for uh, cars and uh, engines to be stored. And this is somewhere along Washington Street perhaps uh, across from Fayette. Now, remember, they just spiked the rails to, uh, to the ties, and it didn't always uh, take. Um, according to Lancaster, they picked the engine up, put it back on the tracks, fired her up, and uh, it did make steam, but it was leaking. So they tried to repair the boiler, uh, it didn't work all that well. They had to get somebody from off-island who understood engines. Um, but this is engine number one. This is Dionys. And uh, she did get back on the rail, and they did fix the boiler, and off they went. Now, the route to uh, Surfside, remember, it was abandoned fairly early on. I think we're sensitive to it this week. That's not snow fence. Those are ties and rails. And that's what a nor'easter did uh, to the roadbed along Surfside. Because it was easy running when they laid it. They just put it down on the, on the beach. Um, but it was the very devil to maintain. And so uh, if you recall, whatever the number was, 1884 or so, they went direct to Sconset and abandoned trying to run along the Surfside beach. Now, here is Bug and birdcage. And it was fairly popular, except it was temperamental. So in the summer of 1913, the bug broke down just shy of the Sconset station. The engineer tried to start her up again, couldn't do it. And so they called a mechanic. The mechanic came out, presumably by horse and buggy. Uh, 
got hold of uh, the engine, repaired the engine, and fired it up again. So everybody jumped back on. And then the engineer realized it wasn't going to stop. And one by one, they dove off the bug. The engineer was the last one off. Everybody survived, but the bug didn't. Hit the buffers at the end of uh, the railroad, smashed itself to bits. And that was the end of the bug and the birdcage. Now you notice there is ironwork underneath. They probably recovered that for salvage, but the broken pieces went into the clay pits alongside of what's now hatches. And that's the source of the myth that there is an engine buried in the forecourt of hatches. Um, it was the wooden debris from the bug in the birdcage, and it's probably well rotted by now. So don't worry about getting your uh, beach magnetometers that you use to find quarters in the beach um, at looking for the engine. I don't think you'll find it. Now, it was gasoline powered, and I looked at this picture very closely. Uh, that could be me. I loved trains, so you, you know, you'd stand and you'd watch them and you'd, you'd wait for them to go past. But I actually had a car once that had a crank. It was an old car, and it didn't always start. So I knew what cranking the car was like, and this looks suspiciously like he's trying to start up the gasoline engine on the bug. Now, uh, there are a lot of pictures of people, but I picked Mr. Sansbury because uh, he became a power in the land. I think he eventually became a selectman. And if you live in Tom Nevers, you know that he lent his name to one of the streets. So he's standing there very proudly. He's, uh, he's got another admirer by his side. And uh, that's Mr. Sansbury. He might have been the one to say all aboard. With apologies for this picture, it comes out of the Athenaeum uh, newspaper um, archive. So this is a digitized version of a picture that was in the INM. It's Mr. Clinton Folger's automobile, which he brought on island while there was a ban on driving. Now, we could argue till the cows come home or the cars stop honking as to whether or not it was a good thing that we rescinded that ban in 1918. But until then, he would have his car hauled from the center of town to the edge by a horse. And then he, when he was no longer constrained by the ban, they'd unhitch the horse, and then he'd drive the rest of the way to Wisconsin. In 1918, that ban was rescinded, and it was also the end of our railroad. So, as I told you, Land development was the spur for the railroad. And uh, at this part of the talk, we're going to show a little bit about uh, our land development history. Um, and of course, the tie of the railroad to uh, first Surfside and then Sconset. The hotel was built. Plots were laid out. The plots didn't sell as well as expected. So to bring the price down, they chopped them into smaller pieces. And that's why we have so many paper roads in Surfside, which uh, in each annual town meeting for the last few years, we've been working to vacate so that the uh, landowners can pick up that, that land in, in yard sales. The hotel was popular for a brief while, but eventually it was abandoned and fell down. So with the assistance of um, Ms. Oldham at the uh, research library, we've got a picture of the uh, 1873 map. It was a uh, developer's dream. And each of those was meant to be a lot. Basically, that is Surfside Road. Um, it, it's moved around several times. The railroad came down across here, and eventually the hotel was in that corner. Got, they got themselves a pretty station, and uh, people were waiting for the train. And fun to tell, up in the uh, hall, the 
Folger Hall just upstairs, is that beautiful model that was built uh, of, of the railroad. And it shows the Surfside Station. So here's the hotel. I was intrigued to see. I looked at the picture very carefully. Some people are still asleep because their shutters are closed. It's either that or they didn't rent the rooms. I can't figure out this room and that room didn't have shutters, so maybe they were public space. But grand guests on the uh, front porch. But it didn't last. Um, we don't, I don't think there was a post-mortem done on the hotel. Why did it fall down? I suspect uh, with a flat roof on top, you know, the mansard roof here, but basically flat up above, um, it collected water, um, wind, rain, lack of maintenance. It doesn't exist anymore. Now, Tom Never's head uh, was named for the point, the prominence into the water, and um, it became a land development, but fairly late, 1916. Uh, and the NHA caption for this photograph is everybody had come out for a land auction, um, and they were going to be buying up land. Well, when you got to Sconset, Sconset was developing into real properties. And so um, the train... It's just here, and that's the back end of Dionysus because it's got the tender. And it was probably pushing the cars into the depot. That's Ocean View House, uh, and of course, uh, the street that's now in front of it is Ocean Street. And I suspect, and the historians amongst you can correct if I'm wrong, that there's a link between Ocean Street and Ocean View House in terms of source of the name. The view from the uh, hotel led to a postcard. You could buy this postcard. And if you can't read the little red print, it says, because that was on the postcard, Sconset Train, known as the 20th Century Limited, Nantucket Island, Massachusetts. Now, the Ocean View House, this is also uh, a postcard. Had a large annex behind it. And Andrew Vorse tells me that there are segments of either the Ocean View House or the Annex that got picked up and moved onto Maury Lane as a private home. And once again, the Annex turned out to be bigger than, uh, than the hotel. But why did I say once again? Because all of these rooms here have the shutters closed. So were they sleeping late or they just didn't rent them? And then this is a contemporary, that is contemporary to the Ocean View House, a view from the hotel with a boardwalk out to the beach. So let's just talk for a moment about tracking the railroad. This is really what, what we were attempting to do. Railroads um, are laid as nearly as possible on level land. Steel on steel begins to slip when I say steel on steel, I mean a steel wheel on the steel rail. We do rubber on asphalt. Steel on steel begins to slip at about 4%. That's a four, feet, four, four foot rise over 100 travel. Um, an automobile can probably do 15 or even slightly higher percent. Uh, that's 15 feet of rise for 100 feet forward. If you're at 15, you're probably seeing a sign that says, caution, steep hill ahead. Um, but railroads can't do that. So they used causeways. They would take dirt from the cuts and they'd put them into the fills and they would make the railroad bed as flat as possible. Because of that earthwork, we're still able to find uh, the roadbed here uh, today. The ideal, of course, is that the cuts of uh, the, the dirt taken from the cuts equal to the dirt they needed for the fills and everything would balance out. But it turned out that wasn't true for the Goose Pond Causeway. I'll, I'll show you a picture of it, and you'll say, oh, Goose Pond Causeway, railroad, of course. A lot of that fill had to come in from off-island. It was uh, carted in on barges. Um, then there was a cut made uh, up to Dave Street and went round the clay pits. 
So I'm going to show you a mixture of old and new photographs and maps to help you see uh, the layout of the road. And that's really the part called tracking of the Nantucket Railway. Many of you know that there were the Sanborn maps uh, somewhere from the 1870s right up to the 1920s, and they were insurance maps. Uh, every property that existed during those days are laid out on the Sanborn map, every road, and for our benefit, the railroad. You can also see the railroad in a lot of our modern aerial photographs. And of course, you can also see it in some of the odd layouts of properties. What do I mean? Let's look. Okay. Here's the train. It's Dionys with two cars. And the track comes right round here on a gentle curve, bringing it to Easy Street. So the bulkhead comes around on a gentle curve. We'll get to this gap in a second. So last week, remember last week? That's when we had sun. I went out and I took a photograph at the Easy Street Basin. And there we have it. The bulkhead hasn't moved. So we know that those properties have to be younger than 1918 when the railroad quit. The gap in there was called the catboat basin. And in the day, it's where a lot of the big catboats are moored. You can tell what time it was. It had to have been between 11.30 at noon when I was taking these pictures, because there's the Nantucket. We noticed as we came in uh, this morning that uh, the bright and shiny eagle is in place uh, with its steam whistle um, left over from the Novska. Uh, I'm one of the ones that loves listening to it. I can even tell that there are two captains uh, because I've got the short toot captain and the long toot captain. Um, and <laughs> next time you take the eagle, you'll figure out what I mean. Okay, a couple, I, I suspect these are uh, railroad people. They're sitting on the track where the uh, park benches are on Easy Street. Now, I don't mean for you to figure out quite what this is, but it's a sample of what we were able to identify, or actually uh, Joe Marklinger was able to identify, as an accurate blueprint of the wharf area. Now, that is the railroad depot, and that's a railroad depot. And in close-up, it says, extension of Steamboat Wharf. So it's basically a little inset onto the main map that helps us to identify the Catboat Basin, which is the same, these are the same two lines here. There's the depot, there's the depot. It was a way of fitting more lines onto one piece of paper, but it was also a way for us to figure out where everything was. Now the train, of course, came from Easy Street, crossed Main Street, and when it was crowded, they had to have a flagman to uh, hold up primarily pedestrians while the, the train crossed. And just to keep everybody uh, aware, we do have a piece of history, downtown Nantucket, um, a club car. We're hoping that the owners will let us put a little placard or, or sign uh, somewhere discreet, um, indicating that it was part of the Nantucket Railroad. <clears throat> now, there was a depot on Washington Street. Uh, stopping points varied. Um, when the train went to Surfside, uh, they actually stopped right at Main Street. Uh, when it went out to Esconset, they stopped at Washington Street. And the little white sign, which in close-up says Nantucket Railroad Depot, um, but we don't know that that's absolutely accurate. We do know that the sign said it was Nantucket Railroad Depot. So we're taking the will for the deed and we're saying that was the Washington Street Depot. And of course, it's the old aquarium. Uh, it's the main ticket office of the old aquarium, soon to be vacated as Mariah Mitchell builds uh, a big structure across the way at 33 Washington Street. The game plan is to pick this up and make it into a bus shelter 
at Dave Street. But before we get to Dave Street, we're carrying on down um, the railroad. And I wanted to show you a sample of the Sanborn maps with the railroad coming down through here and extending along to the end of Washington Street and the Goose Pond. But here's a couple of sightings. Yeah, and I got real close, and you just have to take my word for it. But it says Nantucket Railroad, RR Repair Depot. And it's just about opposite Fayette Street. Um, and so that's where, that's where they stored things in the wintertime. They, first year or two, they left them out in the open. And they came back in the spring, and they realized they had to repair all. The carriages, the coaches were wooden. And they had to repair them and repaint them and so forth. They finally got smart and built some shelters. Today, it's a parklet. It belongs to Nantucket Island Land Bank. And uh, we're hopeful that the land bank commissioners, of whom one or two may be sitting here in the uh, audience, will, uh, will consent to putting up a sign. Uh, the, the goal is to stay very discreet, just a little sign, and then have uh, menu boxes with a brochure. So rather than making the signs very long with little type in them, uh, people will be able to pick up a brochure and, and read. As I say, that, that's our game plan. So here's engine number two uh, at Washington Street in the Goose Pond Causeway. And again, this is another one of these hand-colored postcards. Can't help but tell you that they were looking very carefully at the camera. They were not whizzing past. And today, uh, the causeway is a public way, and it is in the town's plans for rehabilitation as a multi-use uh, path. Um, we got our paper today, so planes are running. And why do I say that? There's a public uh, legal notice in the paper indicating that Mass DOT is appealing to the Conservation Commission for permission to work on this uh, in converting it to a multi-use path. So slowly but deliberately, we are going to get a, uh, a, a well-built pathway through here, somewhat more secure and safe than the Wapley path that's there now. Now, a lot of people use it. Um, you're more than welcome to walk along it. You can see the tire tracks in the mud. So coming back along um, the pond, the goose pond, you look over, and of course, the railroad grade is absolutely level. The railroad crossed Orange Street just in front of 118 Orange. The house was called the Old Spouter. Uh, for a while, it was a ceramics pottery work. And I ask you to look very carefully at two windows to the left of the door, the door, and one window to the right. Two windows to the left and one to the right. It, of course, is the old Spouter Art Gallery. So the railroad crossed Orange Street right there. And it went up alongside what's Hatches. Now, the next time you drive past Hatches, you'll know why it's not square to the street. It's laid out parallel to the railroad. Not necessarily because it's as old as the railroad, but the property lines. Um, the railroad was private property. And until it was taken for um, unpaid taxes and sold at public auction, uh, it was somebody else's land. So they simply uh, laid out alongside of it. The clay pits are the swampy bits between hatches and uh, the marine appliance shop. Now, if we go up to Dave Street, Cape Cod 5 on the left, Cape Cod 5 very kindly put a nice split rail fence right alongside the right of way. And I'm told that negotiations are underway for transfer of the land to the land bank. Once that happens, um, a little bit of money will be raised and we'll get some interpretive displays there. And the people who use uh, NRTA will have a bus shelter right in that space there, which of course is the old uh, depot um, current aquarium. Now, in looking for the route of the railroad, I went to the 
uh, Historical Association Research Library and entered in the search term racetrack. And this 1933 aerial photograph, which probably was taken by somebody in a biplane hanging over the side with a camera, shows us the racetrack. Now, for orientation, that point is Milestone Rotary, and that point, point is Sconset Rotary. This is Old South. That's Fairgrounds. And that's Hooper Farm Road. I'm going to beg your indulgence, because you're going to see, by virtue of my describing it, that the railroad came down through here and took this curve, which is visible in close-up, and went to Surfside along Hooper Farm Road. That's part of how we were able to identify where the railroad is. Now, remember, I think it was 1884, they said, can't maintain it, let's go to Sconset Direct. So at this point, instead of going around the curve, they straightened it out, crossed right here, and went along there, and there, this is Wana Comet, this is Land Bank Land, you can see uh, the layout of the railroad, 1933. Well, the town's GIS is a marvelous facility. There's so much that you can get from it. This is the most recent aerial photographs, and I have cranked up the contrast a little bit to, to help you see, but the railroad crossed Old South, which was probably where they called it Milestone Crossing, right at the um, pedestrian crossing in front of number two fairgrounds. And it tracked through the woods here. This is all Wana Comet. And went out through here, and that's Land Bank Land. Hinsdale Road, some of which is open uh, to traffic and some of which is only a pedestrian way, was the maintenance road. It was not on top of the railroad, it was off to one side. And so if you go walking on Hinsdale Road, and any time you can get a break into the woods, you'll find the roadbed uh, just to your north. Now, the railroad came down, this one really, you're just gonna have to take my word for it, but it's right along there, and then it hooked up and went along here. So on new Tom Nevers, that boundary called Lancashire Avenue is defined by the railroad. It's not, I mean, real estate developers like to do things in rectangles or circles. They don't do trapezoids unless they've got a railroad uh, alongside of them. Let's get a little closer. This is all private land, but the embankment as of 2012 is still in these people's front yard. That was the track. Sandsbury Road, dear Mr. Sandsbury, standing there with the young lad um, in, in front of the depot on Steamboat Wharf. Uh, down here is Nichols. Nichols was also a name involved with the railroad. And then somehow or another, we got private developments up to here. And there very much is the roadbed as it heads to Sconset. Um, so one of our goals is to make sure that people know where the railroad is so that we don't cover it up any more than we have to. <clears throat> I think this is my last picture and I've got one more map. Uh, Gully Road, footpath, so we're in Sconset, there's Gully Road, Codfish Park, the uh, pedestrian footbridge over Gully Road. And I couldn't identify whether that was part of the railroad or whether it was built just after the railroad collapsed. Uh, because I'm going to show you a, a Sanborn map in which the footbridge doesn't exist. But we know that this little piece of land bank property here is derived from uh, the railroad. Uh, when the railroad was sold off for uh, tax purposes, uh, the Jensen family acquired a great deal of it and Jensen became Norwood Farm or Norwood Farm Trust, and we've been picking up as much of that back into town ownership as we can. 
still, the depot was right here. And this is the site of Ocean View House. Sanborn map. There's the end of the railroad. It, again, with a hand lens, it simply says road. But this is Ocean View House, and this is Ocean View House Annex. That is a date stamp from the library. This is the depot, and this one says coal. So out of that, we can conjecture that the railroad was um, coal-fired, not wood-fired. We put all of this in fine detail onto uh, a map. And no, you're not going to be able to um, interpret it. But it's on a PDF. It's on a digital PDF. And uh, when I finish, I'll flash a version of it up on the screen. And we have a paper version here. So uh, during or after the question period, we can certainly uh, come up and see what we've done. Uh, so that's what we meant by tracking the railroad. In case it's not clear to you, that's the Sconset route, turning at Tom Nevers, running along the beach, and terminating right there at Gully Road. The Surfside branch went down here, and we show it. It just didn't pick up on this one. Uh, it's in the water, like a, like a lot of uh, early space in, in uh, Nantucket. It's underwater. One of our committee members, Bert Ryder, uh, is a part-time uh, woodcarver, and he said, you know, I think I can come up with a sign. <laughs> and he got about halfway through building the sign, and then he started building his house. And he said, I'll get back to the sign when I've got a roof over my head. But he gave us a sketch of what he has in mind. And so uh, if we can get permission from the HDC Sign Advisory Committee, um, in due course, we'll have these on um, treated timber posts at key points uh, maybe we'll put a little number on the post underneath and, uh, and a menu box and the brochures. Some people say questions. I just said this is the last slide. Um, our goal in Roads and Right-of-Way is to preserve and protect our open space. Um, we know that some people have told us, gee, don't let people know where it is because it'll get abused. But we have had a history of some things that did, people didn't know where they were. They knew so little about it that, for example, the old right-of-way out to the Founders Burial Ground is now a real estate development. And so we think that identifying, locating, and recording is better than trying to keep it open, uh, uh, hidden. But we do, when we lay these things out, urge that people tread lightly. Um, I said I would show you this is the same picture you just saw but instead of at 27 percent of full size it's at 400 percent and i've keyed in on the easy street basin and the route of the railroad so that's it lindsay thank you very much no problem does does anybody have any questions um we have some time. Hold on just a second. Let me come over with the microphone so we can hear you. Um, how many people did it carry in those two um, cars? I don't know. Okay. Uh, I'm just looking at the car, and I think that you and I need to go to the club car and have a drink and count, and <laughs> count right. up the benches. The other question is how long did it take to get to Sconset? They were doing a round trip in about an hour. Um, Sometimes, really? uh, sometimes less. For example, there was a, um, a 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock, and when I made my little uh, play about the, this is the 1207, the noon train actually left when the boat from New Bedford got here. Okay. Uh, and so the schedule says 1.15 or when the boat arrives. Okay. And sometimes it was as late as 5 or 6 in the evening. Nothing has changed. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else? Oh, hold on just a second. I have a question. I believe that Charles Folger was the postmaster. Wasn't he back in 1918? The one who was driving the car? Uh, the name that was in the um, INM was Clinton. Fran okay, maybe, excuse me, I think you're right. Yeah. But my question is, 
was, were cars only banned in town and not on the island? Because that that's, always confused that's me. That's my understanding of why he was using it, but I'm going to defer to our historian. There's the perfect answer. Milestone, as it is today, was a state road and therefore was exempt from the ban. Thank you, Frank. Does anybody else have a question for Lee? And you're more than welcome to come up and see where your property is with respect to the railroad. Oh, it was not very expensive, uh, 10, 15 cents. Uh, I should have double checked because if you go onto NHA.org, click on Research Library, click on, um, not pictures, what, what's the word they use, Fran, for uh, image collection. And then type in Nantucket on one line, railway on the next, you come up with about 240 images, four or five of which are tickets. Thank you. <laughs>